Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another chess opening video. This one is on my favorite, the Karo Khan defense. It's a very easy opening to learn to play with the black pieces. It's against e4, the king's pawn, which I will show you. Uh, and it's an opening that actually holds a dear place in my heart because when I quit chess between the ages of 12 and 15, uh, the thing that brought me back was a book by Lars Skandorf uh, called Grandmaster Repertoire 7, the Karo Khan. And my first win over a master player rated 2200 was in the Karo Khan. So this video is split into this portion, which is the theory. It's going to be about 15 minutes. All the moves are in the description for you to play around with. And then I have two training games against my subscribers. And I have a Karo Khan course on my website. Link is in the description. E4, C6. If you want something besides E4, got to go to a different video. Here we are learning E4, C6. This is the Karo Khan defense. This is not the Karo Khan defense. It's not just that you go here, e4, c6, and standard play looks like this. You build for the center with your c pawn because if they take you, you want to take back like this in the center of the board. So, first we're going to look at the very standard two pawns in the center approach. Then we are going to take a look at everything besides that. And then, you know, the other nonsense. So, d4, d5. At this point, the way I want you to think about this is... What does white do to the pawn in the middle? Do they take, push, or protect it? We're going to begin with pushing because this is what's played the most because people don't want to take. They see that they can push and advance like this and you can't play this traditional move knight to f6. So against this pawn wedge, theory says that bishop to f5 is the most successful move and the most common. To develop the bishop outside of the pawn chain and then play e6, like this, and then attack the center with c5. Now, this variation is great, but in my opinion, I think the more advanced folks should explore this. I think that there is a far simpler approach for intermediate and beginner players, and I'm going to show it to you. It's my main recommendation in my course, and I, I recommend it for a reason. The reason I don't like this is because if you wait too long, you will be subjected to a bit of a space, space disadvantage. And if you don't know how to handle these positions, you'll get suffocated. So I recommend that against the advanced variation, you fight with this move right away. And the whole point is you're trying to actually get them to take you. Why? Because then you're going to develop your knight to c6. So the c pawn moves a second time to dislodge the wedge in the center. You bring the knight out and the second this knight gets to f3 to defend this pawn, you throw the bishop out there to pin it. Sometimes the bishop will go to f5, but most times you're going to wait for this move and then play this. This is how I like to play this position with black. And let me just show you what this can look like. You will slowly maximize the pressure on these two pawns and then try to take both of them. So your next move, once you get the bishop out of this area, is going to be to play something like e6, because now your bishop is not locked in anymore, okay? Then you're going to take this pawn back. If it gets defended, your knight loves to go to f5. It cannot go to f6, so it likes to go to e7, and then after something like this to f5. Now, if you're confused what's going on with this bishop, if this bishop ever gets attacked, that's a waste of time because you're going to take. And then this has no defense anymore. You just wait a little bit. The, the, the most tricky thing in this opening is when to take that e5 pawn because I don't want you to weaken your king so much. There can be like worst case scenarios uh, where you accidentally, let me just show you just a really funny example, leave this whole diagonal open and get hit with this and lose because now you have to block with the queen and that's bye-bye. So that can happen. You need to stay patient against with c5 and when they take you, right? Stay patient, jump the knight out, get this bishop to pin. Now, if they play something like bishop to f4, you might need to go back to plan b of bishop f5 and e6, because if you block in your bishop, that will just be a little bit tragic, although it's actually not that bad. Believe it or not, in this position, you actually can play this move your bishop will just need to deal with problems later. Now, I only looked at captures, by the way. If they go here, same game plan. That's the beauty, same game plan. Knight c6, you wait for the knight, you pin it, and then at some point, you're ready, right? See, knight e7, or you can take, 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 and you go for that pawn. 
after you take the knight and you take the pawn, this knight pressures the center. You need to go move by move, obviously, whether they've taken you or not, whether they've defended their pawn in the center, but th this move C5, in my opinion, forces the issue so quickly and really fights on the pawn structure, makes white really, really have to defend these pawns, which intermediate players are not very good at. They're not very good at making controlling opening moves. They're gonna lose both pawns. You're gonna have a lot of games you win both those pawns. Just be careful of that diagonal check and try to follow those rules. Obviously, there is more in-depth theory here. I don't go into that in excruciating detail because I want to show you a brief 15-minute summary. You, the more advanced players, can go take a look at opening databases, use the engine, not during the games. Anyway, that's a little bit about the advanced variation. Other variation, exchange variation. Exchange variation can happen after d4 or whenever. Like, this is also the exchange variation. The point is they play e takes d5. They take your pawn. Great. You take back, let me just, well, we, we can look at it with both pawns in the center. You have multiple game plans here. The simplest game plan, by far, get your knights out and actually move them first because you know they're going to go there, knight, knight, easy. And then move the bishop out before you block it in with your e-pawn and then move your dark squared bishop. Super simple game plan. Knight f3, knight c6, knight f6. Bishop, oh, sorry, two moves in a row by, by, by me by accident. E6, bishop d6. Super simple. However, you have multiple approaches. Um, the exchange variation for white when they take on d5 is only considered, according to theory, the exchange variation when they put the bishop to d3. There is a little sub-variation here when they actually attack your pawn with this pawn because they're actually trying to, you know, dislodge you. This is known as the pan-off. It's not known as the exchange, although they have taken your pawn, they have exchanged your pawn. There is this pan-off variation. And by the way, you can employ much of the similar game plan here, but because this is very demanding on your center, what you can do is actually develop and defend it first, and because you don't want to help white develop. You don't need to help white develop here. You want to try to solidify your center as much as possible. So you're always taking with a pawn. You control in the center with a pawn. But there's actually alternatives. One of my favorite things to do in the exchange variation and in the pan off is to actually fee and kettle my bishop to g7. There's actually some variations where white gets to take this pawn for free. But because you get such quick development, again, just like in the advanced variation, these pawns kind of suck. It, they don't do anything. And besides the fact that we're playing a main line that Grandmasters play, which you're probably not gonna get all the time, um, these pawns can be won very quickly. You can use flank pawn pushes to deflect your opponent's queen and knight. But more than anything else, what I want you to think about here is you have options. You can play this in a fianchetto style, like this, the exchange variation, and then develop your pieces accordingly. And your pressure on the queen side might pay off in the future by taking and then having an isolated pawn. But remember, this is the pan off. The exchange variation does not have c4. So you can get a very similar looking position and here either develop standard or as Gotham said, fianchetto, right? You have, you have two options here. And then there's even some more, but this is the very easy thing to do is to, uh, when they exchange your, your, your pawn. And the last thing that you need to worry about in the Karo Khan defense is what if they leave this here? Now, if they leave it here and it's free, like this, I don't know, take it, develop your pieces, don't block in your bishop, play normal chess. There are two ways that they can defend this normally. Number one is with this knight. Number two is the fantasy variation with the f-pawn. The fantasy variation scores very well against the Karo Khan. The knight, d2 or knight c3, doesn't really matter. You're going to take. I do not recommend taking against the fantasy because this will allow white to have a big fat center. So there's no need to allow white to get everything they want. You should be confrontational. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be a pushover. In this case, it doesn't matter that the knight is here because it, it's not really scaring anybody. So you both have lost the center pawn. There are two approaches as far as I'm concerned in the classical variation. When they defend the pawn with the knight, it's known as the classical. Uh, in this position, knight f6 or bishop to f5 immediately challenging that knight makes sense. There is also something known as the Karpa variation, which intends to attack the knight with the knight but defend with the knight as well. So essentially what, I, what, what this looks like is you want to do this. Whereas if you just attack with a knight right away, you need to double your pawns. I actually think this variation immediately attacking with the knight 
is super simple to play, and what I'm about to show you, I guarantee will happen in one of your games. Of course, if they don't take you, you have to develop normally. There's really not too much we can do here. You're going to have to develop Bishop Knight, maybe here, utilize an E or C pawn break to open your position in the future, develop, develop, castle. But if they take you, I like to take with the E pawn, and now the game plan is very simple. Bishop out, castle. Okay, so Bishop out. Now, in this position, maybe don't castle, because you'll hang mate, like Magnus Carlsen did in a bullet game. Um, but obviously, if they do that, you'll attack their queen and then castle. But after you get this, these pieces will move as follows. Slide the rook over to fight for the e-file, okay? The knight slides where the rook was. You actually transfer the knight over to the king side, and you're very solid. Plus, when the knight is on f8, it will constantly defend h7 from where you will never be checkmated. And then I have had students get games that look like this. So let's say you develop your bishops, right? Let's say like something like this. And white just plays this, very lazy move. You can set up a bishop queen cannon to h3 and actually sacrifice. I've had students win games like this over the years, you know, because they get their queen here now with this bishop. Oh, hello, 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 the knight's under attack. Say something like bishop to e2, and now the killer move, because you've put this rook here, slide it forward. The king is completely cut off by the queen, and rook g4 is made. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you're going to win a game like this. Guarantee you. I don't know if it's going to take 10 games or 100. You will win a game like this in the future because people don't know what to do. That's the thing. You have a game plan. If they don't play h3, okay, trade a piece or two, right? Try to expand on the queen side and take some space. Your doubled pawns are actually not that bad because they repel the enemy knight. And the Tartar Coward, truthfully, is a little bit of a difficult one to play. It's also not super common. Um, but you're going to have to deal with it every now and then. Your alternative is to play the classical variation with bishop to f5. After bishop to f5, there is some theory. You need to get your bishop out of the way. If the opponent does this, you need to not get your bishop trapped. This is all in the description, by the way. And um, theory looks like this. It's a super theoretical position. But the thing is, if you're about 1700 or below, no one knows what they're doing. And like 95% of my audience is there. I checked. So the truth is, if you want to learn the theory of the Karakhan, you got to probably like buy a course or study some three-hour video, which might be somewhere in the deep, dark alley of YouTube chess. I don't know. But if you just want a very easy variation to play against the classical, I think the Tarzik Hour is a good way to go. We haven't looked at the fantasy. The fantasy, in my opinion, I think you should play it like this. I think G6 is a very practical weapon against the fantasy. Uh, and you just don't let them bully you. So you'll play bishop to g7, and if the bishop develops early, you will slide your queen out to b6 and actually just go for b2. There is a tricky line here with queen d2, but you're completely safe. You can take an escape, not a problem. And the second white does something with this pawn, you immediately pounce. So for example, you can actually develop. You don't even need to take back because you already won a pawn. Right? This is all in the description for you. This is actually all kind of cutting-edge theory. It's been played many times. And if white shoves this pawn forward, well, that's fantastic. We can attack it with f6. We'll move like f6, get a, our knight out, and if they defend it, then you can even slide the knight out to f5. You have experience moving the knight to f5 because you've done it in the advanced variation. The fantasy is tricky. It's probably the trickiest. It scores the best at intermediate level. Uh, against the fan against the uh, Karo Khan, but but by the way, there's also like very tricky lines like e5, which can be very aggressive. The point of e5 is that if they take your bishop and queen can swarm this diagonal. Very tricky line, not the best by theory, but um, you can play like this, and this is pretty terrifying for White. For example, game can end with knight e2, check here, mate. Congratulations, you've won a game in seven moves. I don't know how much better of an opening video I can give you. So the fantasy is tricky, but if you find a way to attack them and create an attack on their king because they weaken it a little bit early with this f-pawn push, be my guest. Beyond that, there's a few other variations that are not super popular. Um, there is the two knights. If you want to play the two knights like you play a Tartic Hour, you would take and do this. Pretty simple. That kind of overlaps, right? You can also pin the knight, and then very simply, like if they attack you, you trade it just like in the advance and regroup on the light squares. I really like to do it like this, light square regrouping, a little bit passive, but very solid. You can even do this. And now you have seven pawns on light squares 
and now you've unlocked like a hidden gem. You have all eight pawns on light squares because you traded your light squared bishop. Two knights, Carl Khan, not super popular. You can always just, like I said, play the Tartic Hour, but it's seen a decent amount at the high levels. And everything else is a major sideline. Um, for example, you might experience this in the wild. Okay, go review with an opening database. Go review with, you know, some sort of uh, engine after the game is done. Try to play reasonable, logical chess and don't just go completely insane. I can't give you every single iteration of White's first two or three moves, but I'm doing my best. And now, um, let's try to play a couple of games. The first person who we're going to play against is, uh, I believe, 1200. Uh, and I believe uh, they are not online. So let me quickly ping them. I would edit this out, but uh, it's fine. I can kind of keep you entertained. Ooga booga, look, I'm making noises. Ah, uh, I don't really want to edit this out. So let's see if we can get a game. Okay, fantastic. There it is. 1100. Thought they were 1200. Overshone it by a little bit. I think this individual plays the advanced Karakon. So C6. There it is. And d5. And e5. I was right. <clears throat> Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to play my... I'm going to play the variation I recommended, and that's in my course. And see how, how it goes practically. So the critical line is dc5. All GMs play dc5 because it's an attempt to refute Black's opening. Then Black has a couple of methods to equalize uh, and try to do their best. Uh, anyone below the level of like 2400, I'm not even kidding, doesn't know the theory correctly. I'm not joking. I have played a few 21, 2200s in my life that kind of know the theory up to like move seven or eight. That's it. But it's actually pretty unexplored territory at the high level. So even C5 is still being discovered. My water's gone. Okay. Okay. This is actually very good that we're analyzing this. C4 is a very aggressive move, uh, and it actually leads to some pretty fascinating variations. If we try to develop just in the standard way, what's going to happen here is they're going to take and force our queen into the middle. So believe it or not, this is actually very tricky. If you take on C4, D5 gets shoved forward. Be happy you watched uh, all the way, all the way until now. So the best move here, according to theory, is this move C takes D4. You actually have to fight immediately in the center. If the opponent defended, you can wait. But because they have a bit of a lead in development, because they do go first, you got to be like, you got to be super accurate. So we take on D4 because they're not able to restructure the center with a pawn. Their center is going to be very weak. This is going to be very delicate right now. In fact, after Knight D4, I think we can even just take this. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe we'll just take on c4 then, because they can't shove the pawn forward. cd5 is the best move. So actually taking the corresponding pawn, uh, but it's the best move for one reason in particular, which my opponent might not know, uh, because I'm going to have to move my queen out, and then the knight can come here. That's very tough to see if you've never seen this before. So c... Okay, well, yeah, that obviously is, a, is an inaccuracy, because they've just lost the pawn. I could take, but again... I have taught you about this move, so I'm going to play this move now. Um, if they play h3, I might take and then regroup. I'm, yeah, actually, that looks pretty good. Here's a really good example of the fact that you, it, it, we, it actually looks like we can make this trade right now. And we just have to make sure that there, our king is completely safe. It looks like it. In fact, I want to take, take, and then take this. Yeah, I kind of like that. But I'm going to also show you the dangers associated with trying to cash in on these pawns too quickly. Okay? So, look, I'm cashing in, right? There's no check. I'm pretty safe. I hope this doesn't happen because they're going to hang this bishop. So, like, queen e2 is a good move. Queen d1 is a good move. Uh, at which point I'm probably... Yeah, so I'm trying to think. Uh, I could take the bishop and then take, or I could just take on c4. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just take on c4 and... By the way, we are up three pawns on move nine. I understand there's a bit of a rating imbalance here, but these are the kinds of positions that you can also get if you know your stuff. See, our opponent played c4, not actually a move that we covered, but we know what to do against it. You see how this check is not so scary? Because we can trade queens. If that was a bishop, that would be terrifying. But because it's a queen, we're fine. And we're totally okay with a queen trade because we have three extra pawns. So, right? So c4 is, I don't even think I looked at c4. It's actually a very rare move. 
So credit to my opponent for playing it. That's hanging. Uh, I can get my knight in the way. I can slide my king over. I can move my rook. I can also give the pawn away and just try to get developed as quickly as possible. Mm. Th this is what I meant. So I'm going to play a move that I think around this level would occur. Uh, even though it's probably not the best move. I'm gonna, <laughs> I got I to gotta find the, the move I want to play. So King C7 runs into this. You see, this is actually the danger of grabbing these pawns so early is that you, you, you fall behind in development. So King C7 runs into that. King C is just a little bit passive and ugly. My rook gets blocked in. Rook B8 also runs into this pin, which I understand that... Oh my god, it took me like 10 attempts to draw that. Uh, which I understand I can defend, but just looks a little bit unpleasant. So the best move here for sure is probably just giving up this B7 pawn. Just, and then just trying to like get some quick development. Uh, I'm going to play this. It's not a good move at all. And after bishop f4, knight a3, and putting bo both rooks on d1c1, my opponent will have a big advantage. Like, in development. Not according to the computer, but in development. And actually, it, it, it's okay. We'll, we'll very quickly analyze afterward with the engine. Which is why I always recommend that before you go cashing in like at the arcade, you actually finish your development. You, you, you get everybody settled. Uh, this is under attack, so I'm just going to push it. It's not too complicated. Yeah, knight a3, bishop f4 attacks everything in my position. These bishops are super strong. There it is. Uh, if I go knight g6, I gain a little time. Let me... I'm going to attack this bishop back. So, of course, I welcome this trade. Oh my god, I would welcome this trade. But, um... Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go here. See, we're winning time. Now we're winning time. I lost my train of thought. I apologize. Did I? I, I sometimes I feel like when I talk, I like end sentences halfway through. Uh, okay, so again, this is going to be under attack very soon. I, I'm going to go e5 to try to play e4. So I'm very close to getting developed. I've now blocked out that bishop, but I'm going to lose some pawns here. This is not a good move because I can take it. I think knight d2 is required. And then I can't... Oh, see, that's too slow. That's what's going to allow me to now quickly develop the rest of my pieces and get back into the game. I'll close the center. Knight, I'm going to take this probably. I don't even have to, actually, because it's pinned. So I'll go here. And uh, now everything is beginning to get defended. I'm blocking out the bishops the right way. But it was dangerous. And that's totally a position that you can lose. I guess I'll go here and then take the rook. It's totally a position that you can lose. And now I'm safe. Now my opponent does not have the firepower, does not have the necessary pieces, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get my king to safety. That bishop was super strong, and now that we got rid of it, we're gonna be able to, uh, we're gonna be able to survive probably the, the worst of it, okay? So, let's play a uh, rookie eight. And we're going to get the win. C4 is an interesting move for sure. You're not going to face it a lot. I keep talking about it. You're not going to face this move a lot, but now you know how to deal with it because it can explode your center. It can be very tricky to, uh, to play that position. Definitely one of those games where the opening works and then you lose and you go, what the hell? I thought I watched that video. I bought the course. What's going on? Well, that's a good move. Knight D6 is coming. I got to make sure that's not a check. So now if Knight D6 comes, I just take the rook. But... It's never too late to lose a game of chess. You, you know it and I know it. Okay. Now we're going to trade rooks. And the good thing is that right after we trade the rook, this bishop is stuck with our knight and our pawn. F4 comes in. We're going to trap that. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to get the win. Yep. Here. Here. And now this is stuck, that's stuck, and we get the win. But obviously, we're at this point, we are in, uh, we're kind of in the middle game, end game territory. Like, this could have come from any opening. This, we, didn't, we didn't get this position because of the Karl Khan, but it definitely helped. So let's, uh, let's, let's go here. And a couple of ways to win this. Easiest, simplify. Now we have knights and pawns, uh, and opponent resigns. That was a nice game. So let's just quickly analyze. C4, uh, C takes D4, and here... If knight d4, this is already a bit dangerous for black. So I'm just trying to draw your attention to this diagonal over and over again. If you play this wrong, you can just get straight up a losing position. 
Like, this should be five. This is this could be terrifying for black. Uh, you have to be very, very certain that you have to, you know, you got to defend your center, and sometimes you will need to block in this bishop. You'll see it. The engine will point it out. More often than not, you're going to try to pin. But here, if we did this, like I said, we would have run into just a bad position after knight c3. Uh, and after c4 and this, yeah, the engine likes this, but it's not... It's not super clean. Uh, and right here, yeah, King C8 is now almost white is just completely back in the game. So for example, Bishop F4, you, you know, it, even like something like this, how quickly things can go wrong, you know, if you're not careful. And then this comes and then you, you don't, you like go Knight A3 comes, it's, everything falls apart and all of a sudden you're just getting blasted by all the pieces. So now you know how to play that position. Uh, and for the last game, I am going to take on a slightly stronger player, like 15, 1600. I think he's ready. Here we go. Yeah, Trees Eric is a resident memer on my subreddit. And um, I told him not to play the same variation. Okay, please exchange variation. So which one do we do? Uh, we don't know if they're going to play the Panov yet. Okay, Bishop D3. Uh, we can play this version or G6, Bishop G7. I don't know. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna decide after I move my knight. I can still decide. I can still fianchetto, uh, and I'll show you maybe how to play the fianchetto because this this one's really easy. I'll show you how to play the fianchetto. It's a very interesting way to play this position. Trading your light squared bishop on f5, uh, and doubling your pawns and then attacking. So for example, like I'm gonna castle and then I'm gonna play bishop f5. This is one of my favorite ways to play this variation. Knight e5 is a good move. Uh, although, maybe a little premature, because this bishop can get hit with this knight to h5. Maybe? Is that a thing? Uh, very common idea when the bishop is out here. I, I did want to show you about this plan, but... I, I kind of like this. So now the bishop is hit. They have to go knight c6. The thing is, if they go like over here, yeah, so there you go. Now the bishop can move freely. My, not, my queen was hanging. Now that we've strengthened this, we can use the open b file to create some play. Bishop f5 is now no longer our plan because after this exchange, the knight would hang. Okay, so he's giving me the bishop. Now I will show you the secret power of the fianchetto bishop on g7, f6. I know Ben Feingold says not to do it, but e5 is about to show up, and that's going to be a serious problem. In these fianchetto setups in the exchange variation you can always play e5 with a boost of f6 and sometimes it just wins you the game because you get a massive center like right now it's bad for white but in maybe three four moves it will it will just be completely lost so let's see if we can get it to that point so we don't need to take we have good restructuring here we play e5 take take e4 and we would actually just straight up be winning so if takes takes we go here hmm interesting so, I want to push and push again. Yeah, that actually just looks great. <laughs> uh, our pawn structure stays completely together. F5, F4 is coming. And we are overwhelming our opponent here with our pawns. So, something like this. Now, we will have a weakness. Absolutely. We're going to have a D5 weakness. So, take, take. He can line up a few attacks. Now, DC4 all of a sudden actually is possible. Because this hangs. But we can also just keep marching. I really want to keep marching. I think that it's a very simple game plan. Just push the pawn. It's very, uh, it's very thematic. You know, our bishop on g7 is super, super strong. Uh, attacking that pawn on d4, but also... Okay, that's going for this. We can just take... Uh, it, it would also be extremely useful to play king h8 to just get out of the way. But I really do like f3. I mean, f3 just looks... So natural here. Hmm. We actually might need to think here for a moment. So, if we go here, take, take, knight c3 attacks the pawn. A move like bishop e6 is decent, but we're sort of pinned. Like our queen is. Hmm. Our, our, their queen and our bishop are on the same diagonal. So we got to be forceful here. I mean, I could just take on d4, obviously. Uh, but, uh, and then just try to break through. If I play f3, take, take. 
And there's some bishop e4 trick. Hmm. It is not that simple here. Queen b3 was a very good move. I also have queen a5, which attacks a rook and can win me some time, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really convinced that that's a very good move. Let's play king h8. We gotta play a move, so... Uh, that's the move I'm gonna play. I'm actually not that happy about it. I, th I think our opponent has just found enough time here to try to consolidate the position with knight c3. It was a very... In what? That, that was the whole... I, that's why I played king h8, was to, was to avoid... Okay. Well, that was just a blunder. Uh, that's not good. Now I will play f3, because the, the options are to take and open up your own king, or play g3 and just box in your position. Um... Actually, after knight c3, the position was, was not over. Definitely was not over. Let's go here, attack the rook. We'll take next move. We can take this. We can go here. But anyway, that, that's a little bit about the power of the bishop and the exchange variation. You always have this f6, e5 stuff. Uh, I guess I'll take. I mean, it's about time. Oh, bishop h6, by the way. Wow. Was there actually just bishop h6 there? <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's some weird tactics. Bishop h6. Okay, I'll attack the queen. I've been really wanting to play this move because this queen is so awkward. So, there it is. I've done it. Rook. I mean, queen. Queen a3. I said rook a3. Queen a3. So I have a very... Oh my god, I have something so beautiful here. Wow. I have bishop to c2. Bishop to c2 attacks the rook and opens the rooks, and now I have this. And now the queen is hanging and the rook. That is so nice. Wow. Man, if you made it 32 minutes into this video, that is an incredible tactic. The backwards bishop move to attack the queen and the rook still hangs... And there's moves like that to give some checks, but what, that is so... And now there's paralysis, and yeah, wow. This was a nice game. But I do want to analyze. Uh, may, maybe I got a little bit overconfident pushing my f-pawn so much. Maybe I should have played bishop e6. So it's interesting. Still stuff to learn, even at my 2684 rating. Anyway, I'll start summarizing the video. I appreciate you for making it this far, uh, and uh, hopefully you get... Um, some interesting lessons in the Karo Khan. You can obviously always check my course out. I said that a few times already, and there's other longer videos on YouTube, and there's many, many, many there's a lot of content on the Karo Khan. It wins about 55 to 60% of games at the intermediate level, the Karo Khan. Uh, the fantasy does very well against it, but in like the advance, 60% of the games are won with black. So you learn this against the King's Pawn, you can really put some serious hurting on people. Uh, it's a great opening, and people use it from 800 to 1700 and uh really have some serious success as my opponent deeply ponders uh their next piece simply falling unfortunately come on eric make a move okay i guess we will be swapping some pieces here i guess eric is going to be playing until checkmate i've already summarized the video so i don't really know what to do next uh, thanks for watching. Sub to Gotham Chess on YouTube. All that good stuff. And I'll go here. And then I'll go here. And I guess Eric's playing till checkmate, which we will promptly deliver via ladder. Let's rotate over. And let's deliver a confident mate on A1. GG to Eric. Uh, I already signed everything off, so I hope you enjoy the Karo Khan. Peace out. Get out of here.